Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're doing a little catch up with Barbie and Tommy. Now, these are two horses that we showed you when we first went to our new barn a couple of months back. They just came into us. Um, they're owned by a woman in Los Angeles named Julie, and Julie is. Uh, we've been trying to find someone to work for her to work with up in Los Angeles. And uh, this is Robert Neva. He's come down to work with me for the day, and we'll be back next week to work again with these, and hopefully he'll be a place where these horses will go to continue this training as time goes on. But I thought it would be fun for you all to see. This is the first time you know anybody's been on these horses other than Karen and I since they came here, so it's always nice to see where we've gotten to and how easy or difficult they've become for other people to ride. I'm very happy with Barbie here, has gotten to the place where we have a nice sense of flow through her. Now, if you see this horse, she's built um, very horizontally, that is, her neck comes kind of straight out of the body. And she's one of these horses that somewhere along the way had been, they tried to get her neck too high. So she's kind of broken in the neck a little bit, that is, overflexed, but very close to the pole, which is often the case with horses that are very short in the neck that get pulled up in the neck too high as they break back at like the second vertebrae or whether than the third or fourth, sometimes further back in some of these longer necked horses. And of course, a lot of the horses they are being bred with very long necks with these very sloping shoulders so that they, it makes it very easy to pull their necks over and to give you a false frame in dressage, just as it did years ago with saddlebreds and Tennessee walkers. It's becoming the same kind of thing. But with a horse like this, we have to be very careful not to bring the head and neck too high. As you see, she has quite a short neck there. And she's fairly straight behind, so she doesn't have a lot of natural ability to get underneath herself. But she's come to a really good place, and see how she's really starting to stretch now into the contact. And this horse has developed a good sense of flow through her body. That is, if we get her in the right position, she's able to keep her back up underneath us and keep moving in the walk and trot and even the canter. So that's what we're doing here. Robert's just gotten on these horses, on this one, to start with today. And he's doing a good job of just getting her to stretch out and get ahead of her leg a little bit, which she does actually very easily. So this horse is at a really good place now where we have a good sense of flow through her body. She has quite a strong back, this horse. Um, not an overly long back. You can see there's a little dip there behind the saddle. But it wasn't as problematic as many of the horses that we start with. And as you'll see with the second one, Tommy, who's quite a bit more difficult. But this one has really begun to let the stretch come through her whole body and lift up underneath us. And Robert's doing a very good job here of finding that position, just letting her get out ahead of her legs. As you will always hear me say, and it's always interesting and very telling when someone comes, because both this horse and Tommy were horses that were very stuck by being ridden against the hands. And this one had become very agitated, and she was having a lot of trouble with her, you know, being too, this horse being too high and too explosive. And to me, this horse was just confused. Um, as soon as we've let her just move normally as she should over her back and swing over her back, she's just calmed right down and become a, a lovely ride, and all her spooking and running off and this sort of stuff has, has quickly come to an end with this horse. As I said, I think her biggest problem was just being confused. And of course, these horses are easy to confuse one like this because, once again, if you see how when she brings her head high there, the back end starts to drop out from underneath her. But she's gotten to a good place where if we let her be where she can be, she cruises along very nicely, keeps her back up underneath her. Now, right there, we can see she needs to get the neck out longer. She's resisting just a little bit, not really swinging through yet in the trot. But because Robert just keeps adding a little leg and softening her a little bit without getting too uh, strong with his hands, she quickly comes around and starts to stretch into the contact for him. There's basically two kinds of people in the world, those who ride the front end of the horse and those who ride the back. And anybody who had gotten on this, this horse, uh, or Tommy, as you'll see next, and tried to ride them off of their hands would not get very far, which is kind of where these horses were. We can see here how the back end kind of falls out when her head and neck comes too high. So she hasn't quite there. She begins to let the neck out a little bit longer. Still not quite over her back yet. Still a little bit stiff in the movement. Haven't really released her back yet. But she's at least flowing forward. Like there she starts to swing a little more actively. We can see how the neck gets longer and she begins to light up the top part of the neck. And that's very good. And just what we're looking for. Robert did a great job of doing everything I asked him to do with these horses while he was here. But right there, she begins to swing over her back, and we can see how, once again, that neck is pretty straight out from the body, which is about where it would ever be with this particular horse. That doesn't mean the horse can't learn to collect. She can certainly learn to lower the joints of her hind legs and push up into her back, 
more, but a horse like this is never going to have a really high head and neck position. It doesn't mean they can't lower behind, it just means when they do, they're not going to have a real high neck set the way some horse that's built with a big sloping shoulder and a much longer neck. So with these kind of horses, it's very important to get their neck out in front of them so we can get the horse to stride over its back, which is doing pretty well here. A little higher than we'd like it to be yet, and you can see how she's still a little short strided. But at least it's flowing. It's got a little bit of bounce, as I like to say, to the stride. In other words, she's pushing up into her back pretty nicely. I noticed that from the time we started, remember when her head was so high, now look how she's starting to let that neck come a little bit more forward. But we're seeing a good movement in the diagonal pairs here. We're not seeing the hind legs just completely falling out behind the way we were there in the first couple of strides. This has been a horse that, as I said, not very complicated. Once we just simply showed her how to move correctly, she's pretty happy to do that relative to her ability to do that. She's still a little bit out of shape, so you know she runs out of steam pretty quickly. And you can see there with that change of, change of direction how she tried to hollow there a little bit. But Robert did a good job of putting her legs on, his legs on rather, and just sending him for forward. And notice as she lowers that head how much better the swing looks. Like about there is pretty good for her. So we wouldn't want her pole to come any higher. See right there, she starts to bring the pole up a little bit. We see how we begin to lose that swing over the back. So head and neck position must be always relative to what the rest of the horse is doing. Unfortunately, so many people today are trying to start with what the head and neck position is doing. And when we do that, everything else deteriorates. Right there, now she starts to swing really nicely right there. And that's what we're looking for. But I really like how this horse has really developed a nice sense of forward swing. She doesn't have a lot of resistance to the movement. You don't have to use a lot of leg on her. She's quite uncomplicated when she works within the framework that she can actually work. That is when we're not asking her for things that she can't do. We'd still like her to stretch a little deeper than she's doing here yet, but that comes in the course of this little workout here. Robert is a three-day event rider, and I'm always happy to work with three-day event riders because I think today it's so much more important than people I'm seeing better riding in the three-day event world than I'm seeing in the dressage world these days. For the last Olympic Games, for the first time, we saw better dressage in the three-day eventing than we saw in the actual dressage test. So that tells us a lot. But of course, when you're three-day eventing, your life actually depends on whether the horse is moving over its back again or not. Remember, in the last uh, few years, we've had so many people killed in the jumping world by rotational falls. And that's what happens when you ride horses hollow and you force them to jump fences. Because when you go cross country, if you do that, eventually a horse will take off too soon to something because it thinks it, it's not allowed to stop. So it will try when it probably shouldn't and uh, end up falling through the fence and then flipping over on you. And that's how so many people have been killed in the last few years. So it's so important to have horses moving through the back and that they are working as uh, companions with us, our partners in the work, so to speak, you know. What I like to say is, you know, if my horse doesn't think it can jump a horse fence, you know, that's my fault because I haven't educated it well enough. And you can see how right here she's starting to swing quite nicely, a little short in the front, but when she gets that neck out, it swings a little bit more. So now we do a little canter with her. With this one, this one has quite a nice canter. She gets over her back pretty nicely. Head's a little too high here, but as he lets her lower it a little bit there, we see how the, the diagonals swing nicer here, even in the canter. Now, of course, the canter is a three-beat gait. When I say the diagonals, I'm talking about the inside hind leg and the outside hind leg. Outside foreleg, rather, excuse me. But she does that quite nicely. A little stiff in the downwards transition. It isn't quite well enough, but we see how after that canter, we get a better stretch and more activity. So as I was saying there about the 3D event riders, once again, it's so important uh, to, you know, to work your horse as a partner. So if the horse doesn't think it can jump, I don't want it to try to jump a fence that it isn't educated enough to do. So as I said, you know, when horses have those kind of problems, that's a rider, the rider hasn't educated them well enough. But if all their education is they get, all the education they get is if you don't jump, now look how nicely she starts to swing there over her back. Now that's much better. Now we're getting more freedom in the shoulder. She's starting to swing a little bit. 
You know, so if a horse doesn't think it can make it, I don't want it to try to jump the fence. I would rather have a stop, you know, than a flip over on top of me, if you will, or an injury to the horse. Once again, if a horse has a stop, it's because you haven't educated it well enough. Now, that's really quite good. Now, that's about optimal stride for this horse, about right there. The neck is about as long as it's going to get there, that she can get. And we have a good swing to the, and notice how we have a little more length of the swing of the shoulder in this direction now. Now Robert's about to try the canner, and then she how she tried tried to speed up rather than go into the canner. So he just balances her a little better, and goes to the canner in this direction, which she does really quite well. She really has quite a nice, comfortable canner, and gets her back right up underneath you. See the head and neck doesn't come too high; keeps a good swing in the gait. Robert does a good job of staying with her, and notice how he's never fighting with his hands with the horse. He said, if you were trying to fight with your hands with this one, or especially the next one, you would not get very far. And notice that after that canter, then we get a little more stretch, we get a little deeper stretch, and a little more swing. So that was really quite nice for this horse. If you go back and take a look at the video, when I did the long video back a couple of months ago when these horses first came, you would see how very different these horses are today than they were then. Now you can see how behind the saddle with this one, how that's really started to flatten out. If you go back and look at the previous videos of this horse, you'll see how she had quite a hole behind that saddle there in a dip, and that really that lower back has really come up a great deal, and she's really started to swing really nicely together and over her back right there. Now that's really good. That's what we're looking for. So good enough for today and good enough for Robert's first ride on this horse. He did a very nice job with her, didn't get any fights with her, and uh, stuck to what she could do and was able to get there very easily. Come back to a nice stretch in the walk. So that tells me a lot about how far I've come when I can have somebody come and just jump on the horse and she goes quite nicely like that. That means we've come a long way. Look how nice and long the neck is and how much smoother it looks. I say this is a horse that was broken in the neck, but way up near the pole, like in the, in the second or third vertebrae. And that's often where it is with horses that are kind of short neck, because people tend to want to pull the pole up. And, you know, because there's not a lot of neck, they tend to crank over in those last few vertebrae. Few vertebra. Now, here's Tommy. Same thing here, Robert riding him again. Now, Tommy is a whole different story. Tommy was a horse that was completely dead to the leg. Um, he's very short-winded, that is, so you'll see as we go on here. A few weeks ago, if you tried to trot the horse, you would literally just have to whip him to even get him into a trot. So what I realized about him is how out of shape he was. But when they bought this horse, he basically, what they saw him do was canter and jump and little else. And they said he did that very calmly. Well, I don't doubt that. This kind of horse that we would have looked for years ago as a field hunter, as, you know, the kind of horse that he's so kind of, um, lazy, if you will, that, you know, you get him with other horses and they perk up and you've got a nice horse on their hands. So he canters quite well. So I did a few weeks of doing basically walking and cantering this horse and then trotting him at the very end. Now he's still lunging. And I should point out both of these horses, I lunged a little bit before Robert got on them to get them warmed up and swinging over their backs because neither of them are at a place yet where you can just jump on them and go. So we can see how kind of short strided this one is. He kind of this one feels very much, uh, as I explained to Robert here, he kind of feels like you're on a drunk and you're walking him. There's no because there's no energy flow through this horse yet. You can't feel the energy wanting to flow through the horse's body. It's very stuck. And he was the kind of horse where any kind of little anything that he could pay attention to, his head just goes straight in the air and he stiffens his whole body against you and his mouth against your hands. So I'm very pleased with how far he's come. In fact, I rode him this morning, and he was really wonderful. I had the best ride I've had on him yet, where he really got that neck out in front of him. But you can see he's built quite straight behind also, and you see how he wants to take those little short, flat steps. And just getting him to release it first, even in the walk. And you see how the walk, it's kind of, you always feel like you're uh, driving the car, if you will, with the brake on when you work this horse, because he's always just every step you have to work for. But in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten a really nice walk out of him that started to come and started to flow more. Even the trot, his trot work was actually quite wonderful this morning. 
So once again, it's that issue of he needed more wind. This horse was just so out of shape. If you start cantering, you can't hear it on this though. Um, but you'll see when I bring him back from the canter, he starts breathing really heavily and blowing out like that. So when you have horses like that, whenever you have a horse that just doesn't want to move, there's something wrong with them. They're just completely out of shape, or as I say, I call them a couch potato horse, like a person who hasn't been off of the uh, the couch for a long time, and they just don't want to move. They're, you know, it's hard to get in the gym with horses like that, or with people like that, if you will. You know, so same thing here is just getting the horse to release and just get enough fitness that the horse wants to move. So as I said about, I spent about three weeks doing mostly just walking him out, trying to get him to go, then cantering him, then coming back and working the trot after the canter work. You can kind of see how he doesn't really let go of that neck here. And if you watch him, his behind end, how stiffly he moves in the walk. But also, once again, watch as he does bring the neck out longer, how the step becomes more active behind. Remember, that's always what we're working on. So, you know, the, as far as what the front end does, it's just keeping it from interfering with what the back end is doing, is what a good rider should be doing. In other words, allowing the horse to find that place where the head and neck is in a position for the level of the horse's um, development that it allows the horse to swing freely, over, uh, freely and through over its back. So we can see how that walk, still at this point, he's, you know, uh, he has that feeling, as I said, like you're on a drunk, you go to the trot, and it's just kind of like there's not much movement there. He doesn't want to get going. And you can see how he's kind of short. Once again, he gives you that impression like he's going with the brake on, which is what it feels like when you're riding him. So he begins to get out here a little bit better in the trot. And starts to move a little bit, but you can still see that hesitant, where every other stride, he's trying to throw his head up in the air. He's trying to basically quit with you all the time. So with these kind of horses, you've got to work on just getting that energy flow, whatever that does. So if it means that they're, they don't have wind, remember, now, if this horse had a bad canter, we wouldn't be able to canter him. But happily, he, I, you know, I think that's basically all this horse had done in his life was canter because um, he does that quite nicely. And you can see he gets a few strides that look pretty good there before he puts on the brakes again. But you can also see right there it starts to swing a little bit, and that's what we're looking for. Though it's still not quite enough. He's still holding back quite a bit. And as I said, when you ride him, it feels like you're kind of on a drunk. Like, he, you know, there, you can't get enough movement going through him that you just feel like you're on something that's flowing underneath you. Just has that hesitancy. And same thing here, why that looks a little better. He's starting to get the neck out a little bit in front of him. A little better than it was, but once again, you still feel like there's not a lot of energy flowing through him. That's a little better there. Notice as he releases that neck out in front of him. That looks a little better. Now watch the hocks again. Always watch the back end. As we get the neck to come forward and loosen, Notice how much more the back end is able to move. So this is the kind of horse that I would call kind of bridle lame because in, in order to try to soften him at all, if you take any contact at all, it's just really like a two by four that you're holding on to until he starts to stretch. So that's why after letting Robert feel that and what he's like in the walk here, we're gonna do a little bit of what I've been doing with him and take him to a canner now and we'll see how much different it is. And notice that we come back to the walk, and once again, it's that slow, poking kind of walk where you can just barely get him to take a step. Walk looks a little better there, but he still needs another foot or two of length of his neck there to really free that stride the way we'd like it to be. And so we're always looking for is to get, we want to ride the sense of energy. That's what impulsion is. Impulsion is energy that you can control and direct into movement. Think of it as that. It is not, as so many people think today, impulsion is not making a horse nervous. It's not nervous energy at all.
so now we go to a canner here. And I have him get off his back because you can't sit on this horse's canner because he'll just kind of collapse in the middle with you. So I'm getting more of a two-point position. And at least this, he canters pretty uphill. So this horse has quite a nice canter. It's really, as I said, I think that's probably what he mostly did in his life was go out and canter and jump some little fences. And, you know, once again, he's such a quiet horse that he's the kind of horse you can do that easily with. I mean, as I said, he looks like the kind of horse we might have made into a field hunter and that, you know, is so calm. Then you get him out with some other horses and they perk up enough without going crazy. Whereas you have one that's a little bit on the muscle and you take him out with other horses and start galloping and you find yourself in a whole other ball game. But notice that after that little canter work, the trot looks a little better here and the next begins to get out in front of him. So that's always our rule of thumb. If whatever you're doing, if it improves the horse and the horse can do it in such a way that's not damaging. In other words, if you have a canter where the horse is cross cantering or just, you know, completely hollow in the canter, then you can't do that. But if the canter is actually better than the trot work, with which for this horse it is, it's perfectly fine to do the canter. So that's part of what we call equestrian tact, you know, knowing what the horse can do, what works best for the horse. And fortunately, this one has a pretty good canter. Now, if he didn't have a good canter, then we wouldn't be able to do this. If this canter were completely on the forehand and he was completely hollow and falling apart in the canter, this would not do him any good. And we'd have to spend a lot more time just walking and just trying to get the horse out ahead of us just in a walk and get the horse a lot fitter before we could even begin to ride them if they're that bad. But same thing here, you can see how this walk, it just kind of has the brakes on. If you watch the back steps, they don't just step up evenly and actively and push through the back. There's always this bit of hesitancy. The more he relaxes that neck out in front of him, the better it looks. So as I said, this is the kind of horse, if you tried to ride this horse off your hands and pull him into a frame, you would get absolutely nowhere because he would just basically stand still. You'd never get him to move or you'd have to beat him half to death to get him to do it. But once again, if you look at this canter, this is quite nice. And I said, this is what I think he probably knows more than he knows anything else. Kind of strikes me as the hunter kind of horse that never really got trotted much, that people walked and then cantered and did some little fences with. Now this canter still needs to have the neck, I'd like to see it reaching out, but it's not a bad canter. It's basically uphill, it's pretty balanced, and he seems to enjoy it more than he enjoys anything else. So at least he gets up into this and we get a little energy by doing this, but once again, you wouldn't want to sit on a horse like this. You want to be up in the two-point position. If you tried to sit in the middle of his canter, like even there, when you see he does sit, immediately just everything starts to break down. So. We have to ride him where he is the freest, that allows him the most freedom of movement in through his back. And once again, after that little bit of canter, we see that the, the uh, walk work becomes a little better here, of rather the trot work. He has a little more flow in it, but that's where this horse is. You know, most of this horse's work, we still do a lot of work from the ground with this horse. He's just not fit enough. And you can see when you come to trot him like that, he just kind of braces against the bridle and that back end doesn't come through. And so we never want to have to beat a horse into going. If we have to do that, there's something wrong with him. And with this horse's case, now you're not hearing this, but I had him stop cantering a moment ago because he was just breathing so hard in the canter. So when you hear that, that tells you the horse doesn't have any wind. It's like a person, you know, you, you might think you want to go on a three-mile run, but can you actually do it, you know? So it takes a while to build up. And remember, with most horses, especially of the heavier sort of straight-legged type like this one. You know, this horse doesn't have a lot of natural ability to flex his hocks. If you go back and look at the early videos that I did of this horse when we first brought him in, you'll see that he was almost had almost no flexion in his hocks at all. And when he moved, his legs just really literally fell out behind him. So I'm very pleased with where he is right now, but he still has a way to go, as opposed to the mare that you saw, who has that easy now sense of flow through her body, and she's easy to ride. It, um, her owner rides her now and does a very nice job with her. So we're hoping that these two can go up to uh, Los Angeles and hopefully in Robert's care and he will continue to come down and work with us with the horses and and that we'll be able to get to a great place with both of them and Julie will be able to ride them, which is of course always my goal. So very good work there. Now we come back to the walk there and you can still you see it's a little bit longer than it was and a little freer. 
but you still have that sense that you know that you're on something that you're in a car that's a little out of gas and it's kind of sputtering as you're going. But at least now we don't, you know, you don't have to uh, get after him with every step that you take, and especially after the canter work. And that's once again what I realized after working him was this he does pretty nicely. And if he can do it nicely enough, like he does, well then we can build the wind, and then later the trot will be better. Whereas if I tried to work the trot on this horse, you know, you'd end up just wearing yourself out and him trying to get him to go. So Robert did a great job riding both of these horses. He didn't come out and, as I said, you know. <laughs> My least favorite thing in the world is showing horses to people, for instance, when they're for sale or something and letting people you know, come out and get on horses, which is why I don't sell horses anymore, because I got tired of that scenario of watching people come out and try to ride when they can't and letting them get on my horses. So now we only work with our own students when it comes to buying and selling horses, which makes all that a lot easier. Once again, you can see how he's trying to get a little more out of him. And once again, if you try to push the walk too much, then he just gives you a bad hollow trot. So this was really good. I was really pleased with the way Robert rode these horses, and I was pleased with the way they went for him relative to what they're capable of doing. So we will continue to follow the training of these two horses for everyone as we go on. They'll be at my barn here for a while longer before they go up to Los Angeles, but we'll keep making some videos, and even after they go up there, hopefully we'll be able to follow along and see their progress. So great work here, Robert. It was a pleasure meeting him and having him come down and work with us. We'll see him again this coming week. And we'll see all the rest of you soon. This is Will Faber from Art to Ride. There, he gets a pretty good stretch right there. <laughs> it's about the best we can hope for.